Okay, to speak to us this evening is one who is known to many of us, uh, a great servant of God, and we have interacted in many forums. Um, the first time I heard him preach, I think it was on radio. Was it on radio? Yes, many years ago. And, and I thought, wow, that, that's, that's, that's powerful. And then we interacted uh, when he was, I think, chairing the board for the missions. Uh, as a missionary uh, for CITAM, we really interacted. And we want to thank God for Elder John Nganga. Some of you have interacted with uh, him. Professor Kongo told me that he met uh, Elder when he was introduced to an evangelistic team many years ago in Jabini Boys, where I was, I was uh, two, I think two weeks ago, and uh, many young men gave their lives to the Lord. So we want to thank God for Elder John. He is together here with mom. He is going to introduce her. And I believe that we shall be blessed as we look at building relationships that work. And uh, just fasten your seatbelts and be ready to, to learn and hear God's word this evening. Father, we thank you and we give you praise. As we listen to your servant, may you open our hearts and our ears to hear what you are saying to us. And I believe that after this, our Father, we will be a more stronger church because we will be more intentional in building relationships that work as families, as individuals, and as church. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's appreciate uh, Elder John as he takes the podium. Buana Sifiwe, I suggest you turn your chair towards me. Otherwise, tomorrow you end up with a neck ache and you are likely to call it uh, Paul ache that, that the pastor made us look on one direction. So be comfortable. If you are eating, enjoy your meal. It will not offend me at all. Just enjoy your meal. But uh, even if you are eating, turn your chair so that you can, you don't have to end up with a neck ache. I'm glad to be back. At least I've been coming here since, uh, uh, since uh, who was the founding pastor? Jumba. I can remember when it was a new church, he invited all, I think prison officers, to an evangelistic dinner or something. And... Um, so, so I've been involved with Sitam Dika Road right from the start of the, of the church. And I'm glad to come and find such a big number. I am from Vare Road, and I don't think we get big numbers as big as this. You people are a step ahead of us. Yeah, I hear, I hear there are more than 300 mouths tonight. <laughs> you know, when you come for a dinner, you bring your mouth. Am I right? Yeah, so there are more than 300 mouths, and that's not a small number at all, at all. And I'm grateful to the Lord that we have that number. I've come with my friend, uh, Rebecca Nganga. Dr. Rebecca Nganga is a lecturer at Desta University, where she has been for more than 27 years. And um, I want her to just come and share. Since I'm talking about relationship, and the deepest relationship I have is of this girl. So let her come and say something. We met at the University of Nairobi. Um, it will soon be 50 years since we met. <laughs> it will soon be, I think there are, there are three years remaining for it to be 50 years since we, we met and have never stopped looking at each other. Yes. Uh, good evening. Yeah, grateful to God to come. I... Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, I was told that uh, we are coming, and um, I am asking where, that our dinner, uh, where, it is in the church, where, uh, so, I mean, I'm struggling, it is true, I mean, it's okay, I'm going, but where? So I was told Vicar Road. 
Okay, occasionally there is a thick up system, there is closet, there is, they all seem to be on the car road. Uh, so I'm asking, okay, tell me, I came as a driver. Uh, and so that's why I'm here uh, as a driver. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I don't, I mean, it's a job I don't mind doing uh, to take, I mean, to take a meal. Um, I don't know, I am grateful that the meeting is uh, in this place where I have preached. And uh, actually, as we were turning in, I still remember the day I was coming to preach and so grateful to God that I was on time, only to get jammed the, at the turning. <laughs> and it refused to go. <laughs> that I said, what? I knew this is now a challenge. So to see us standing and coming, I am grateful to God and also to be here. I would be more grateful if, um, okay, when you grow old, you tell stories. And if you don't get those stories, something will not connect. This, yesterday, uh, my husband and I, we joined a group of people to go to greet, uh, to say Paul to one of us who had lost her husband. And, uh, the, you know, all the people are older than me. They were my teachers. They were the people who sang the choruses that form me and preach the sermons that form the content that I am. I, I mean, as I sat and listened uh, to their testimonies and walk with the Lord and remembered the camps that we would go for and the testimonies of believers, I cannot but praise the living God. He is the same God. There is a word that goes around these days about people being youth. And therefore, you come for a function, but there is no testimony of anybody who has been walking with the Lord. There is no song or a duet prepared by a praying people to come to share so that people can go singing the song. I don't know what happened. I have knelt down and said, Lord, is it this person called Master of Ceremony? or a museum, or whatever it is that has made it difficult for God's people to talk about Jesus. Anyway, as we walked yesterday, remember the song we used to sing, let's talk about Jesus, let all the world proclaim. Can we talk about Jesus? Can we talk about his love? I've come listening to uh, one of the Christian uh, radio stations because I was driving my husband's car. When it is mine, I listen to us. Uh, I, I mean, I was in general, I will not be on the same station. Uh, and uh, so I, I mean, I'll tell you why. Uh, we, it was a prayer session. People are not having rent. People are not having I don't know what. And I'm asking, so what? What is the mission? Why did Christ come? What were we told to do? Are we doing it? How come our prayers are not associated with our mission? Or what is the mission? My friends, we, let's, as we go, let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about his mission. Let's talk about the murdered. Let's distinguish the kingdom of this world from the kingdom of God. We have, uh, now we, the, we don't need the world. We are already the world. Now, can we come and talk about what the kingdom of God is about? Relationships. Jesus Christ came, if you read John chapter 14, 15, it's about relationships. That you are word in me, and I knew that you be in the fine. Where is that word? Why is it not coming out? Why is it having to be recited with an assistance of MC? Friends, let's talk about the mission. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's remember, it is not the majority. The road is narrow, few find it. Strive 
to be on the narrow road. I am striving. I want to spend eternity with Christ. I want to keep on the mission for which he came. And so in our relationships, I want us uh, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, that we remain on course in a world that keeps putting us off course, that you can go for a day without meditating on the book of law. Talking about politics, parliament, which are important. But uh, where is the book of law? Is, our, is it the one that we meditate on day and night? Is it what we, it is? We, oh, beautiful wife. My wife is short. She is tall. She is friends. Let the world talk that way. Our business is not wife comparison business. We are on a greater mission. And we had better be. It is not about marriage. We have, church currently has made marriage a destination. That is the church. It may not have anything to do with the kingdom. Jesus Christ did not, that's not what he talked. He said we be friends with him. And when we love with, uh, God with all our heart, we will love our neighbor. Even the one who we share the house and other things. God bless you. Amen. We are not yet 44 years married, but in a few months it will be 44 years married. The other years were for other things. <laughs> the topic I've been given is quite general because I was told by the pastor there will be people married, some not married. We're just a church family. So I'll refer you to, to the books I have written hoping that you can get the details there because I'll be, very, I'll be very general. But I've written a book on friendship. Um, simply how to relate with one another. My books are available from Scripture Union Bookshop, so you can check them up or ring them to find out who is their nearest bookshop to you. And basically the aim of that book was to help us to understand the importance of relating well with others. Then after that, I wrote a specific book for young people. How to translate from being single to being double without accidents. Because a lot of people have, some of the people married here, they are not talk what happened before they were married because of the accidents that happened. Thank God they are already forgiven. But it's very important to understand that those of you relating and you are still single, there is a process that can ensure you don't live a life of regret. And let me tell you something. Those things that happen in the process before you are married can interfere with the marriage itself later. And that's why you need to be very careful how you deal with, 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 that, with that. Then I have written, when COVID came, I got opportunity to put my notes from marriage, marriage uh, seminars in I thought it one book, but it ended up to be four books. I wrote up the first book, I said, marriage, is it Christian or traditional? Because some people here are married in a church, but they relate with each other as lawyers. So you need to understand, <laughs> there is a lawyer marriage and a Christian marriage. You know, in a lawyer marriage, even if the baby is crying, the husband may not speak the baby. It's too embarrassing because the lawyers, the lawyer Bible doesn't allow it. Now, so we... <laughs> We need to understand what is your marriage. Is it Christian or traditional? The two are totally different. Then I wrote another one that talked about something that has become very common in relationship today. It is, a, it is come we stay. And if you say come we stay, it also means come we go. Now, you need to understand, you need to understand that in God's economy, once you decide to relate, it is until they do us, but, and I call the book, The Long-Term View of Marriage. The people who write the forward, the qualification is they, have, they had to be married for more than 40 years. Like my friend, um, Bishop Adoyo, is one of the people who wrote, and all of them, there are two people who wrote, and, they were, and also, of course, we, Rebecca and I have also been married by more than 40 years. To remind people, it is possible to enjoy marriage rather than endure it. But there are principles that will help you to go that way. 
Then after that, I wrote another one that, uh, that, that talks about marriage challenges. Saying, if you are relating with one another, not just in marriage, any relationship, if you are together for three months, one year, and you have never disagreed, bees be very suspicious. The only alternative possible is one of you is a pretender. The other alternative is that both of you are pretenders. The third one is that you are lying. You have never met. <laughs> so my book says, God created us male and the very fact that you are different means you will disagree. Because the way women think is not the way men, and women don't think badly, but you also don't think badly. But the trouble is, we think differently. So you cannot be married to your wife for a year, and she has never disagreed with you. Please be very, be, be very careful. That, those are the type of people who will drop you like a hot potato, and you have no idea why they left. So if your wife disagrees with you regularly, every time she disagrees, hallelujah, I'm in a good marriage. <laughs> because in a bad marriage, people never, you know, they are killing each other. Have you heard of it? Those are people who don't disagree. Because the reason why people don't disagree are likely to be three. Number one is that I am so afraid if I disagree with Rebecca, she will leave me. So every time I disagree with her, I say, ah, if I mention it, you're trouble. So I, I keep bottling it. Are we together? So when you see your wife not disagreeing with you, it's because she's afraid you might drop her. Is that a good marriage? No. Number two, the reason why you don't disagree is because one or both of you are not having a proper brain. In other words, they can't understand the way things are going. So sometimes, what did he say? What did he mean? I don't want to look foolish. So I don't ask. And that's not going to be a good marriage, isn't it? And that's why people don't disagree because, you know, if you are teaching a class, you ask any questions, no question. There's a possibility they never understood you. And if you are talking to her even she doesn't understand, she is not likely to have any question. So the reason why there is no disagreement with your wife it's because she doesn't even know what you are talking <laughs> about. And it's important to understand that. So again, is that a good marriage? No. The third reason why you don't ever disagree is because she knows she is not lasting there. In Kugu they say, Dikenja ruwabue, oku. The moment she knows we are parting anyway, why disagree? <laughs> Have you ever gone to a hotel and the standard is so low that you know you, have, you will never come back. Do you normally complain about the food? No. If you see a customer complaining, it's because he has the intention of coming back. So you need to understand, if your wife will not disagree with you, it's because she is planning what time it will be exit time. When I say a woman, it's because I'm a man. Even women think the same way. Am I communicating? So do not be very happy that you are a man. My man is so good. <laughs> he cannot hurt a fly. The reason he can't hurt a fly <laughs> is because he is seeing the exact point. At least for the last, we've been married uh, uh, almost 44 years. The last 25 or so, we have been involved in marital counseling. And I've talked to people saying, you know, I'm waiting for my firstborn to finish from four. So you don't quarrel. But the day my, first, my last born finishes from four, we are done. <laughs> there is a, a woman called me to, to the, on a counseling says, I just wanted you, I just wanted to, someone who can listen to me. Because I'm so excited. My son is just about to finish from four. I'm so excited. What are you excited about? I'm leaving. Now you know, <laughs> so you need to understand that when people don't quarrel, like my book argues, it's a very dangerous thing. So my book is uh, Overcoming Marriage Challenges. Anyway, the last book is called The Game of Marriage. And the reason I call it The Game of Marriage is because when a husband and a wife meet, it's actually a team that they form. The trouble is, 
if both of them are scorers, it means all of them are running at the front. When the ball changes direction, it can just go into the goal inside. <laughs> because there's nobody to defend. Are we together? Because what the wife, when, the husband, when, the wife, when the wife sees the husband doing something, he said, even me. Have you heard of men who say, I'm not going to do MBA? And the wife also says, even me. Now, both of them are struggling to do MBA. And it's a two-year thing. Why can't one start and the other one? Says, but I also want. Now, in the meanwhile, the children are left without anybody. And you know, I'm, not, I'm talking about some of you seated here, but we're not going to mention you. Now, you need to understand. You waited until your wife said, I'm going to MBA. No, 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 no. A, a wife cannot do before. Uh, and he has already registered. So he also went to registered. So you started suggesting that the children should be taken to a boarding school in Saturday too. Now, you need to understand. <laughs> Many children are suffering because of people trying to do the same, the same thing. That's a bad relationship. Are we together? A good relationship is where you have a common goal with agreed roles. It's calling to the same direction. However, let's be clear. We are not discussing just marriage. We are discussing relationship. We how to build relationships that work. Because you can have relationships that don't. I told you in marriage, some people endure marriage. Others enjoy it just because of the way they relate. The book, the chapter I have found that deals with the subject best. There are many, many of them. Since I've been speaking, we have been, my wife and I have been speaking in marriage seminars for a long time. But the one I find that summarizes is Romans chapter 12. Just because Paul is talking about how we can relate with one another. And he says in verse one, therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Remember the subject is relationship. But it starts by talking about offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. The reason why he is offering it at the beginning is that any good relationship begins with understanding of a common God, a common person to be worshipped. If you really want to relate well with the people, find a way of winning them to the Lord. That includes your own parents. There will always be a problem between you and your parents as long as you are worshiping different. Haven't you noticed when a lot of people, old people have gone back to ancestral worship? Am I right? So they want to do a ceremony at home. They are calling you. Are you going to attend? Are you going to attend? Now, by saying no, you will be in trouble. In fact, they will tell you they are going to curse you. Am I right? Where is that coming from? Because you don't have a common person to worship. Common worship of one God will bring us together. And so if you really want to relate well with your son, the most important thing you can do is to help your son to know the Lord. The moment your son, that teenager, gets to love the Lord, you will see your problems just go. Because once you are worshiping the same God, he will bring you together. That's why if there is anything you can invest in your sons, is to ensure every year they go to a camp. I happen to be in KSCF, Kenya Student Christian Fellowship, which is deals with teenagers. So I can always tell you about a camp where young people are coming together. Now, my, like my wife said yesterday, we were meeting in a, with, the, with the people who are elders, the people who used to preach to us in the 1960s. And I was reminded one of them, you know, you came to my school 1968, and you, you came 1969. That is their age, they're around 80. I'm 70, they're, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are around 80. And you look at them, they are married for 50 years and enjoying their work with the Lord. It all begins with how you invest in the teenager. And you need to understand very well that your son is your son. You can even prove it with DNA test, but he's not necessarily your friend. A friend, and a, a friend and a son are two different animals because friendship is voluntary. Are we together? So your son can choose whether to be a friend or 
No. In fact, he looked at the father and their relationship because the father is a bank. Every time he requires money, 2,000. School fees. Because the father is not a friend. He is a bank. Now, you, to make your son stop becoming your, a banking customer will require a process. Are we together? And the most important process is to teach him to trust in God, to worship God, to fear God. And that's why you need to invest. A lot of us just invest in the education. We need to invest in their spiritual growth. And you'll see your relationship as a parent is going to improve. So that's what we are learning, that before you talk about relating to one another, relate vertically. And once all of you are relating vertically to the same God, you will see yourself come together. You know, even, even in marriage, the same thing. Some of these brethren, every time there is a conference, they run there and they leave the wife cooking. Another conference, they run there and they are growing spiritually higher and, and the wife is still down there. Now, can't you see why your problems are coming? Because you are not investing in the spiritual growth of your wife. Don't agree to go for a spiritual meeting without your wife. If she must cook, why don't you employ a cook for those few days and go to listen to the same message? It's very important. If you, the moment it's saying you offer your bodies as living sacrifice, you start relating well with one another. So which relationship are you representing here? Is it with your parents? Is it with your children? Is it with your spouses? The, it all begins with investing in spiritual. And you know some of us, it's not my topic today, but some of us, our children already know that we don't value Christianity for them. How do they know? They come home and say, Papa, I was number one. He says, son, I'm proud of you. I'm buying your bicycle. When the, your brothers, who are his uncles, arrive, the first thing to do with your is, do you know your father was number one? Because the boy is named after his father. Do you know number, number was number one? I'm so proud. Every uncle is talking about pride. Then the following term, the son comes and says, Papa, I got saved. Oh, is it? You are saved. Wonderful. Thank you. Even me, I got saved at the same age. The uncle comes to visit. Nobody mentions that the son got saved. The boy understands. What matters is great. Did you think with the God? Even my father knows. The same thing. You are dropping your children in school and you drop, and you know, sometimes it can take a long time. In fact, I wondered, I have three, and I wondered, will this ever had? Waking up early, dropping them, you know, now it's many years since our last born finished class 8, 1998. That's the last born, when the last born, and that's the last time because they went to boarding school in high school. That last time I dropped somebody. It can be difficult. But you know something? Most of the fathers seated here have never dropped their child in school late. That's how committed we are. <laughs> but in the church, which is 10 o'clock, you arrive at 11. Now, the son understands. School matter. God, neither here nor there. So you are not helping in your relationship with your children because the unity that would have been there and better relationship is not there. Let me repeat, habits are caught, not taught. No amount of talking to your children will ever make them know the Lord. It is when you start acting with the knowledge. Am I communicating? And that's really what you're talking about. So today our discussion is on relationship. And I'm telling you, what a Trobis, who was a big writer of our teenage years, I don't know the, the book still exists, but every young Christian of the 1970s read Walter Trobisk. And people here who are over 60 will know who I'm talking about. He wrote, I loved a girl, <laughs> or I loved a boy. I can't remember what the title was, I loved a girl, or I loved a boy. But you all read those books. But he said relationship in marriage is like a triangle. God is the apex, the wife on one, one corner, the husband on the other corner, and what happens is, if the two want to be near each other, they must go towards God. And the nearer you are towards God, the shorter the distance between you and your spouse. Am I communicating? So it's important to understand that you are talking about marriage or difficult. I know why it's difficult. 
Either one or both of you are no longer worshiping Christ. And you think it's no more. I'll, I'll repent later. In the meanwhile, you have no wife. All because of your walk with the Lord. Am I clear? Verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here, we are learning. Do you want good relationship? You must agree on modus operandi. What are the standards? What direction? We must have a commonality of rules. They are being told, don't conform to the pattern of this world. And that's what my wife was referring to. The church is spending a lot of time. You have a dinner like this, but you are trying to copy the dinner you saw on TV. Am I communicating? So people dress like that dinner. <laughs> people walk like that dinner. People dance like that dinner. You know, there's nothing wrong with a sheep on, on the water. There's something wrong with the water in the sheep. The other term for that is sinking. So there's nothing wrong, no, absolutely nothing wrong with the church in the world or on the world, whichever you want to call it. There's something wrong with the world is in there, in the church. And if you truly want good relationship, you must set up the standards. And not just say verbally, live by that standard. Are we together? You know what happens? I've written another book called Integrity, the Late Masters of Good Leadership. The moment you have created the Bible and where let your yes be yes and you are no, your wife will start trusting you. And when she trusts you, when you tell her to jump, she will ask you, how high? She will not ask for a thesis. You know, a thesis on why anybody should jump. <laughs> your relationship is suffering because of lack of trust. Am I communicating? Yeah. For trust to be there, you must stop having the pattern of this world. She catches you doing something. You know, I'm a man. You are not a man. You are a godly man. A lot of men, that's what they say. But you know, men do. <laughs> Which men? You are, a, what, you are a heavenly minded. Don't copy the patterns of men. You know, I passed through Karomaindo. Doing what? <laughs> Am I communicating? You know, and I know I don't have enough time to deal with this. When your standards become standards of the world, then your marriage will go the direction of the world. And in the world, people are not in marriage to last. It's as soon as the son is old enough. When you come to Christ, the standards are clear. Until death do us part. There's a way of treating each other. That's a biblical standard. It's not a pattern of this world. So if you don't want to relate properly, continue copying the world. And you'll see it will hurt trust. You know, yeah, there are people who wear the phone, they, write, they keep writing on the phone, darling. And they don't mean darling, it's a workmate. Surely, don't you know her name? It's very important to, un <laughs> to understand. <laughs> then you tell your wife, pick that phone. She picks and the name is called Darling Otieno. Now, you need to understand, she has a right to start doubting. Am I right? And that is going to erode trust. And as soon as trust is gone, your relationship has gone down. And you stop enjoying marriage and you start enjoying it. All because of following the pattern of this world. So if you really want a good relationship, even with your parents. Don't talk to them according to the pattern of this world. Talk to them by, and, and you know, once they understand your standards, once they know what are your standards and you don't keep changing them. Do you know something? When they have something fishy to call, all the other children will be called and they'll be told not to tell you. So you never collide with your parents. When they are calling you, nothing happens. Now, but it, <laughs> You enjoy your time with your parents. Because they know your standards. Are we together? And you are consistent. Don't say, I am saved. And I'm not suggesting you stop saying. But more important, your parents want to say, 
the other day you had a crisis with your brother. How did you act? Did you act in a worldly way? Or did you act in a Christian way? Your parents are watching. And from the way you reacted, you revenged. They know your Christianity is a mouth exercise. Am I communicating? But the moment your parents understand you are serious with the Christ, they respect it. And your relationship with your parents will become better. And the same thing with your children. There are children where if you have no school fees, they say, you ate it. You don't even want me to go to school. The other parents, when the school is not there, the children on their knees praying. They know for my father not to give me school fees. It's a crisis that only God can intervene in. And so instead of him fighting you, he is praying with you. And your relationship remains, despite no school fees. Am I communicating? We are talking about the relationship, whether up with your parents or with the children or with one another. It's important to understand you must not succumb to the pattern of this world. Verse 3 says, For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with a sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. In other words, if you really want to relate well with me, you must first of all accept who you are. Don't pretend. You know, sometimes you pretend to be an angel and you know you are not. You know, your, your boyfriend kept telling you, my angel, my angel, so started imagining you are. <laughs> so every time there is a disagreement, you failed. And you, me, I'm an angel. How can I fail? No, it's you. And a lot of men are suffering without bitterness, like Kenyatta. Because even when it's obvious the girl is the one wrong, she's an angel. She cannot be wrong. You have women who never say sorry anytime. How can I say sorry? I'm holy. I'm angel. My brother, let me tell you. Angels don't marry men. So the moment that girl said yes, and you now know she's not an angel. <laughs> if she was an angel, she would not have accepted your proposal. So you need to understand. But then the trouble is, the angel must not, he is not an angel. It's important. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Because that's really what is going on. And obviously it's pride. It's a problem. My friend, your relationship will be good when you start accepting and saying sorry when necessary. In my book on friendship, I give three, what I call three friendship royal words. The word please, the word sorry, the word thank you. And I'm not talking about saying it, I'm talking about meaning it. Because you see, when you think you are always perfect, can you ever say sorry? Or you might say sorry, but you don't mean it. And I can tell from your face, you're just talking because Nganga told you to say it. But when you really know very well the reality is, my husband has failed this time, but I have failed many more times. So we are two of a kind. So when, he's asked, when he says sorry, even before the sentence is over, you have already said, I forgive you. And you are not joking. You actually forgive him because you know you are not better. When you think you are better, it's very difficult to forgive others. Am I right? And the moment it is clear you have done wrong and you have refused to be sorry, it becomes difficult for us to relate with one another. It's the way to kill your relationship. The word sorry not just said, but meant is going to make your, your relationship go higher. In fact, of every problem, that sorry makes you start operating at a higher, and with every quarrel, higher. That's why I told you quarrels are so important, because they just lift your relationship to a higher level, but only if there is a word, sorry. So the word of God is saying, don't think of yourself more highly. If you do, the relationship will suffer. In which area? Is it with your parents? When you are pretending you are not who you are? Like some of you pretend you are very rich. Your parents actually say, you know my son seems in money. And you have none. Everything you have is borrowed from the bank. And the bank is on your case. 
But you reach home, Papa, <laughs> the Lord is so good. <laughs> I'm swimming in. Until he says, by the way, my, your, my brother, your, your uncle, is suffering. Can we take him to India? But in that time, they don't want, need words. They need cash. Pesa, that's rim. That's when you give none. And your father knows you're just being mean. Because you are rich, isn't it? Why? And a lot of people find it difficult to be real themselves. Some of them are even more dangerous than that. You make your life think you always have money. Then you reach. When you reach, um, when you reach uh, her place, she's donning, don giving money every life center. After all, she knows the husband never runs off money. On the way back, you go to a petrol station. And uh, she says, I finish all the money. Even me, I have none. I thought you always have we are here. It's very embarrassing. What on you know, in law's place, and the car can't move. Oh, because you pretended to be who? You are not. Am I communicating? So you need to understand these words written in the Bible are real. Hmm? Do not think of yourself more. It will cause you problems, not just with God, but with one another. Now, verse 4. Just as each of us has one body with many part members, and these members do not all have the same function. Here we are saying accept, or rather own up. You need others. In other words, you are given in this area, but not in. Let me ask you, have you ever told your friends why they are important to you? Or you keep telling them, <laughs> are you not lucky to have me as a friend? In other words, they need you, but you don't need them. If you want, nobody wants to relate with somebody who has no needs. We all want to relate with people we, so that we are, we are sometimes beneficiaries, other times benefactors. If you are always a beneficiary, that relationship will die. So my sister, why don't you tell your husband why you believe God was wonderful to bring him to your life? And don't just talk words. Just, and don't pretend, tell him the truth. Do you remember last week? This is what you did. I know even if I tried, I'm not good in that level. So when I saw what you did, I just felt hallelujah. God thought of me in creating you. Now, name about five of them. And the guy will sleep like a baby tonight. Now, you need to understand, tomorrow, he'll be thinking positively of you. Am I communicating? And that's something that you need to ask yourself. Have you understood that God gives us gifts differently? One has us gift, the other one has another gift. And that's why even in church, we cannot have a church of one man show. Because he doesn't have all the gifts. We have different gifts. But we need to recognize each other that the gift you have is not what I have. Maybe your gift is being talkative. You think on your legs. When you are starting to, what is the subject? You have already got an answer. Now, we thank you for the gift. And we are grateful that we view the party is always lively. But please also admit that most of the time, because of talking before you think, when finally another person talks, you wish you were the one who talked. Now, why don't, <laughs> don't try to be different, but tell them, my sister, that is gold. I wish you were the first one to talk. I'm so happy you have talked. Let people know you need them. And the moment they feel needed, they will come to that safari group. They will never be. But when you behave like they know it all, they wonder, why do we come to the safari group? Why don't we leave it to the two couples? After all, they are the ones who know. And you wonder, why is the safari group dying? You are the one burying it. <laughs> you must let people know why you need them. Because it's true you are gifted, but there's an area they are gifted, and you are not gifted. But of course, we are also talking about marriage. And sometimes you have wives that behave like they're just perfect. And you know, these days become more complicated because a lot of women are earning more than men. Am I right? That has become serious. Because the guy tells you now, oh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you want? What do you bring into this marriage? As if the only thing to bring is 
money. And she already knows your salary because you are a Christian. You have told her she is earning 100,000 and you are earning 50. But she keeps talking about why don't you bring more? You are not working hard. You are not a go getter. And people who are not go getter had better go away. Now, you need to understand. <laughs> you need to understand that language is not going to build your marriage. Don't refer to the 50,000. Refer to the way he looks after the children. The children are excited every time the father comes home. Now, imagine he was not away. What would happen to your children when they have nobody who can talk to them? And you know there are many men using us with children, and yet you are special. So good with children. Isn't that a gift? Why don't you tell him, every time I see the way the children look at you, I just am proud that I got married to you. My children are growing adjusted well because of having a father like you. No reference to the 50, just because that's not, <laughs> that's not the subject. Are we together? Yeah. And then you that knows your wife is earning double, every time you buy something, I say, isn't God good? I wish he brought the money through me, but he has chosen to bring the money you. I'm grateful that you came to my life and the Lord has blessed you that way. Let the wife know. Let your wife know you appreciate her double salary. Am I communicating? But you know a lot of men don't even want it mentioned. <laughs> no. In fact, they say, how many? Pesa. And you have none. Now, you need to understand. <laughs> There's no way you have a good, a good relationship until it is true you have gifts. But they're true that your wife has gifts you don't have. And the Bible is advising us, if you want good relationship, acknowledge there are some gifts you don't. And acknowledge your wife has gifts you don't. And the same thing with your sons. Admit there's something you're doing well. Another day, some, some families were visiting each other, and they were all schoolmates. And the children were, were talking outside. Every boy, they were boys, every boy said, my father used to be number one. No, no, say, no, mine was always number one. No, my father was the one who was number one. Maybe they were not in the same school. I thought they always said they were in the same class. Sure, they were they? Oh, number one. And you know, small boys below 10, they don't bother. See, they are so sure their father was the one, number one. They all went into the house. Say, Papa, sort us out. I'm telling him you are the one who was number one. Now, before his friends, of course, he can't admit None of the above was number one. <laughs> what do you think the child felt? You are destroying the early animal I told you about trust. And you relate badly with your son because he doesn't know when to trust you and when not to trust you. Admit. You did well in school, but you are not number one. You see, even number, <laughs> I went through alliance, and even number eight still has a name. So just admit you are number eight. <laughs> Am I communicating? Don't pretend you are number one when you are number eight. So it's important to understand that lack of admitting who you really are is going to ruin your relationship. All these are God's words on how we can relate better. Look at verse five. So in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all others. Please accept you belong to one another. Don't talk to your wife like she's a stranger. Remember her destiny and your destiny are together. Am I communicating? And so we, each member belongs to all others. If you are from the same church, the same. If you are from the same family, the same. You are siblings. You are all children of the same father and mother. You can't ignore them. You must know that you belong to one another. And the moment you admit, and mean it, people start relating well with you because they know, although you are not as rich as them, you are still part of, of them. But you know, a lot of people don't feel, feel like they belong because everybody else is rich. They're the only ones poor. They suffer from inferiority complex. And a lot of people have that problem, even in church. They start at the door. If you pass, say, can you imagine? You came from the same church. I'm walking. He can't even give me a lift. Now, surely, 
How does he know where you are going? How does he know you're not speaking an Uber ahead? Now, you need to understand, those people are not proud to go on foot, yet God, for the time being, has given them the privilege of going number 11, two legs. Now, you need to understand, you need to understand, in as long as you are playing that game where you don't feel you belong because you are not as good as others, or you don't feel you belong because you feel higher, you know, once you belong to one another, levels will not matter. Am I right? Because you are part of one another. That's what happens. Your children must know. The one who is number one in class, and the one number class, number last, okay, both of them are number one. Only one from the front, the other one from the back. But they are children of the same father. They must know they belong to one another. But if you start talking to your children, like the one number one from the front is special, and the one number one from the back, it's an embarrassment, they soon discover they are not together. Are we together? You know, my wife likes saying, let teachers be teachers and parents, parents. To a parent, a grade is irrelevant. You are in maternity, you saw this your child. Why are you treating your child the same way as a teacher? You know that teacher knows them by marks. You, you are in maternity, or is it called a delivery room? So why are you treating one child better than the other? And children know, my mother only a tier no matters. You end up with a problem. That's how some couple called Jacob and Rebecca. It's not, sorry, what, what was she? Yeah, and, and it was Isaac and, and, and Rebecca, who actually started saying, I like the one who hunts. No, no, me, I like the one who farms. Within no time, there was a dysfunctional family. And, where did, and they almost killed one another. Am I right? And it was planted by the mother and father. So if you really want a good family relationship or a good work relationship where you work, it will be very, very, very important that you always emphasize the fact we belong to one, we are one team, the messenger, the MD, our one team. Imagine if the messenger stopped cleaning the toilet. It was made on everybody. Am I right? Can you see how important a messenger is? Let the messenger know how much you value him. Because for sure, what he does matters. And in fact, if there was a crisis, the one job, ever, even if the MD is left alone, he will clean the toilet. Am I right? Now, that's how important cleaning the toilet is. So you need to come to where everybody matters. And in your family, children are not valued by Max. They all came through the same delivery system. You can't treat them like that. You don't even treat them by beauty. After all, they were both from you. One took your nose, the other one took your ear. Now, but the one who took your nose, you think they are more beautiful. But they are all yours. Am I right? So it's very important to understand if you want to relate well with one another, that sense of belonging, where people feel accepted with unconditional love, is what will make you be well related. And that it needs to operate at work, needs to operate in your father's family, it needs to be everywhere. Verse 6 talks about we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, another one serving, another one teaching, another one encouraging, another one contributing to the needs of others, another one leadership, another one showing mercy. Here we are being told, identify, acknowledge, appreciate your unique gift. Earlier we, were, we wanted you to acknowledge that you have certain gifts missing. Here you want to admit you have gifts. Insecurity comes when you think you don't have any gifts. Here you are being told, identify you have. Don't pretend you don't. Sister Atieno, can you give a testimony? No, I can't. Actually, inside you know you have a testimony. But you feel like, but I'm Atieno. Surely, nobody knows. And you want to stand and your legs are having fellowship. And it all comes out of not identifying the gift God has given you. So the word of God is saying, it will not be right for you to recognize other people's gift and not recognize your own gift. You must know there are things you are gifted on. I've written another book called Discovering Your Life's Purpose. And I give an exercise to identify the gifts. They're not yours. God has given you those gifts. Because it's a ministry he wants you to do. The moment you know that gift, like for example, maybe you have gay three children. 
The mother is trying the baby to cry. They're crying and they can't stop their own baby crying. And then you appear, you smile, and the baby is smiling. You think it just, just happened? It's a gift God has given? And maybe he's calling you to Sunday school. It's very important to... to <laughs> very, but you know me, how can I teach Sunday school? Oh, no, no, no. After all, my husband doesn't even know, think I have anything. Now, you remember, it's not the work of your husband to recognize your gift. The Bible doesn't say, tell your husband to recognize your gift. It's you to recognize your own gift. Once you recognize it, you appreciate, like we said earlier, the gift of others, but you also know you have something to contribute. So insecurity is one of the worst things where you feel, and there's something they are calling these days imposter syndrome. Heard of it? Where you are promoted and you start thinking, I don't deserve it. What is it? What were they looking at? It can't be. And I know that, that, I know that feeling. Because the school I went to, we were not placed in numbers. We had a headmaster, a Mzungu headmaster, who did not believe in positions. So each person got their marks, and it was not shared. There was number. I, the last time I knew my position in class was 1967, when I finished my primary school. When I went to high school, never heard of it. So it meant when, in form, when you are going to Form 4, they selected a number of people and were given awards. And mine was for academic excellence. And I thought, it's because I'm a Christian. There's no way they can give me academic, because I was not doing well, according to me. Did I know others were even doing worse? But you see, <laughs> in the meanwhile, here I was, not recognizing my gift. So I felt I went for the price, but thinking, looking around, what do they think? Imposter? Central. But you know, in our time, the result appeared in the nation newspaper for the whole country. That's 52 years ago. My, the, our result appeared in the newspaper. So the whole village you will see will be looking for my name because they know who was in high There were very few people in high school. Only to discover I was in the top five out of a class of 105. And I thought, you mean they were not wrong? Because these are now national. Am I communicating? These are now national exams. But I had thought that they must have sympathized with me because I'm a Christian boy. How many of you are failing to accomplish God's purpose? Because you don't want to recognize the gift God has given you. And because you don't recognize it, you don't contribute. Because you don't contribute, you are not failed in the group. Because you are not failed with the group, your relationship suffers. Our topic is relationship. And people who know their gift find it easier to recognize other people's gifts. My time is up, but um, may I say one more thing? If you really are going to relate well, it will be important that you love other people. You know, Romans 12, we continue, and we have just, we have just read um, the list of items. And before we come to verse 10, in verse 9, it says, Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Here, love must be sincere means you are not allowed to pretend to love. But there will be no relationship where you do not love people. And the love we are talking about is agape love. A, a love where you, people don't deserve to be loved, but they are still loved. John 3.16 is your verse, is related with one another. Because with Christ is our example. For God so loved, do you know the word is full of crooks? So the people who are loving are crooks. And if you don't believe it, go to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Christ Jesus loved us, for he was yet. There was no improvement uh, program. He loved us while you are still sinners. Now, the same way, you need to love people who are actually sinners. They are not even improving. Like your husband, surely. Who doesn't know he never improves? But remember, <laughs> remember, love is not on the basis of things done. Love is not a feeling. Love is a decision. Am I communicating? You just decide to love. And people, you are loving people who don't deserve. And if you really want to relate well in relationship, you must ask God, for his type of love, a love that um, actually allows 
the verse 10 to appear. Verse 10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. In other words, you love people so much that there is a competition between you and them and you allow them to win. You honor them above yourself. That's really how you are going to relate well. Why don't you keep talking about your husband's many giftings, many appreciations? And in fact, my recommendation to you and me, I'm also recommending to myself, is that before I see something wrong in Rebecca, I first of all list five things I'm proud about Rebecca. That way I will earn the right to say, one area of improvement. A lot of us just have a list of all things that are wrong with your wife. You know, you can actually produce a dictionary. Now, because <laughs> do not expect your marriage will be enjoyable when all your mouth opens is how Ugali is like soil. Now, you need to understand that although how Ugali is like soil, her chapatis are yame. Why don't you concentrate on the yame? Chapatis. And then the yame are the onions eaten. All of them. Finally, you can see, and by the way, your Ugali needs to improve. Now, if you have already talked about the good things, that good things, she'll say, yeah, yes. But you know, I never grew up in a place where they cook Ugali. I am willing to go through lessons. Can you teach me? Am I communicating? That's what will help you. Now, you know, these things are easy to say, very difficult to practice. That's why we started with you coming to Jesus and worshiping him. Offering your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's the only way you can start relating well with others. So its vertical relationship improves. The horizontal one will also improve. When you discover that your horizontal relationship is not improving, please suspect that either you or your spouse or your other friend, one of you or both of you, are running away from the apex. And no wonder you are not relating well with one another. Let us pray. As I pray, I want to suggest that you just ask yourself, what have you heard God say? When we live here, you can still go through the chapter. I have left out many verses out of that chapter, all of them talking about relationship. What do you hear God telling you? Not telling the church. Telling you as a person. Not telling your spouse. Telling you. Are there, are there areas that need to change in your relationship with God? Are there areas you need to change in your relationship with your spouse? Or your relationship with your boss? Or your relationship with your junior? Or your relationship with a colleague? Your relationship with your parents? Or your relationship with your children? Which of the many factors you have discussed is the Holy Spirit saying, Something needs to change. Why don't you tell God, I admit, that area I'm not doing well. I know I always concentrate on what the other person has not done. But today you are talking to me. I want to admit I need your forgiveness. Let me ask my wife to come and just conclude this meeting in prayer. Praying that all of us will sense God's presence, will sense the Holy Spirit, as he comes into our lives. Number one, to point what is wrong. Number two, to Rebecca, just come. Number two, to point out what we can change. Not what the other person can change, what we ourselves can change. So that as we live here, our relationship will be better. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you are God who is love, that we get to know you through relating with the Lord Jesus Christ, who came so that we live, and whose emphasis, uh, not just emphasis, but command, is that we love one another, that uh, without this, we, the, we will not see the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you brought us here to remind us. We can think of many examples, but nobody can teach another. Thank you for the gift of the Father that Jesus Christ promised the disciples 
that it was not just about the mission. It was not about the speed. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we are doing our own thing. No wonder we are so influenced by the world. Our models are the world's people. Lord, you never left us to be looking for models. You left us to look up to you, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be walking with you. And it is each one of us individually to love you fully, that the love of God is not contested. Father, I want to pray, beginning with repentance. You spoke to Moses that uh, your name is not going to be used in vain. Your name is not a label. It is a strong tower where the righteous run and they are safe. Father, we have used your name, identified ourselves with you, but lived a life that contradicts our testimony, that we have not sought you we have just used your name anyhow. I want to ask you, Lord, for forgiveness. I pray for repentance. How are we using the name of the Lord? How are we attaching the name in Jesus' name to our prayers? Do we have a relationship that enables us to know what Isaiah saw when he got a glimpse of heaven and he saw the Lord on the throne with the seraphims, that this is not a God to play around with, to be standing and saying you feel the presence of the Lord when you know clearly there is no such a presence. It is simply your own imagination. Father, I want to pray for the repentance and are returning to the living God that we have an opportunity to have you. Lord, manifest your power in our midst that we may know that the one we are talking about is the one who lives above the circle of the earth, whose thoughts are not our thoughts, whose ways are not our ways, whom we cannot go to command and instruct in prayer. Asking him to come and not set other people, which shows we have no idea of who we are talking to. Lord, I want to pray for forgiveness for casual usage of your name. Where we treat like you have not answered our prayers the way we wanted because we come to you as your advisor. Lord, I pray for forgiveness. For without a clear, respectful, honoring relationship with you, we cannot have good relationship with one another. Father, I pray for fear of the living God. Fear of the living God, not just the systems in which we work, but the living God before whom no thought can be hidden. I pray for repentance when we know deep down we are controlled by ideas from either our ancestors, our relatives, our friends, but not the word of God. And then we go representing God. Father, I pray for forgiveness. I pray for genuine coming to the Lord so that you touch us, that you speak to us, and that we continue to experience the blessing of God in our relationships, that together in our families, for those in marriage, for those with relatives, that every one of us, may our greatest hunger be hunger for God, that nobody will need to be reminded to read the word of God, to meditate on the word of God, to listen to the Lord, that every one of us, our greatest thirst is for righteousness, is for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That where we work, wherever we are, we are not that this concept that has come in and become a, 
a hindrance to the kingdom that there are those who are full-time ministers or things like ministry. Those terminologies, I want to pray and renounce the use of terminologies that is simply making it difficult and praying for every believer to be filled with the Spirit of God so that where we go there is healing. Where we go, demons are cast out. And those of us in this meeting with the demonic spirits, I want to pray for the casting out of those spirits for we cannot have relationships that where the powers are contrary to the power of the living God. Spirit of the living God, we pray for deliverance. We pray so that the power from on high can reach down to us so that as we go, the lepers get healed. The sick get to, 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 he, to be healed. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. I also do want to pray for our gatherings that when we gather together, every minute can be accounted for for the kingdom. That there will be no time that we cannot, no chorus will be sung that cannot be accounted. It's not about our self-pleasure. That worship is not about our self-pleasure. That we need to seek the mind of God so that we walk in the ways of the Lord. That the kingdom of God is established in our midst. That where we do our work, the universities we teach, Father, I pray the kingdom of God, excellence, praying that yes, because we are there and calling on the name of the Lord, and we can testify of what we see manifested. Where we work in the hospitals, where we work in the county, it is not a question of assigning blame, but taking responsibility because we are the priests wherever we are that we are the church of Christ wherever we are, that our ministry is not in gathering in this tent. It is wherever we are. We are the ministers. Where we sleep, with whom we sleep, wherever we are, may thy kingdom come, Lord. May thy kingdom come so that our relationships are guided by the love of the Lord and acknowledgement of the sacrifice that Jesus became so that we may live. Father, keep us reminded that yes, we are on earth, but on earth on duty. Yes, we, the way we organize ourselves does matter, but we are in charge because we have the kingdom and we call upon the name of the Lord. May the prayer life be where we begin. That before we go to talk to others about our relationships, may we talk to the living God. May we seek the living God. Where we see behaviors that are difficult to deal with, Father, is then a thing too hard for you? Help us to be a prayerful people that recognize you are God in control and you are God in charge. And there is no human being created in your image whom you cannot touch. And you have put us there not to see what is going wrong, but to be the witness, to be the people, the God with through whom your Holy Spirit touches and, and melts those people. Father, I want to pray that this church will have room for testimonies. Because as the believers become the priests of God, as they go in the name of the Lord, there will be people transformed, that there will be room to share about God's goodness. Real sharing, not just the people coming to clap and to cheer each other, but things related to kingdom, aware that Jesus Christ is coming back and is coming for a pure bride, holy church, not just the people that um, think that they worked for him. He is coming for a people that were on duty with him as, as he ministered on earth. So, Father, I pray for every father, for every mother, for every brother, for every sister. May our relationship first begin by that relationship with you, and then we pray about our relationship with one another, that as we relate with one another, may people become better, more fulfilled, and, and, and may the sick be healed so that the kingdom of God is preached. Thank you, Lord, once again for this opportunity. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.